It is always a privilege uh, to have my brother Bob come and speak to us. Uh, recently, he went on a trip to Ukraine, which he's going to be sharing about that. He has a table set up here in the front afterwards if you'd like to come and check some of those things out. We're going to turn over the service to him at this time. It's always uh, an amazing honor to be at, uh, invited to come and speak to one of Scott's churches that he pastors. Um, it's kind of cool. It really is. Um, before I get started tonight, I want to just, there's a, a painting on the table over here. I'm not going to get a chance to mention this later, but there's a little painting right here. Um, some of you will recall that a couple of weeks ago, um, I was contacted by one of my pastor friends in Ukraine. Um, uh, they had a, a, a number of their youth that had been invited to go to a camp in um, Hungary just to get away from the war for a little bit of time. And the campground gave them free camping, if, but they didn't have any way to get them to Hungary from Ukraine. And so he reached out to me and asked if we could help um, provide uh, $900 to bus the kids to, to Hungary and back and send two adults with them as, a, uh, as chaperones. So we did. The, this church gave half, and the Moroa church gave half. Um, so that was really cool. And um, he had me over to his house while I was there, um, and uh, his 16-year-old daughter painted this um, for, for, for me, and, and just I wanted to share that with you. It, it, she shared, and the other kids that went were there, with their parents and they shared about how much it meant to them that we uh, had helped them with that, search, with that situation. And uh, as Scott said, there's some stuff there you can take a look at that, so please feel free to do so. <clears throat> Two weeks ago today, very early in the morning, I was making my way through the airport in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. I was uh, it was really early and it had been a lot of travel already to that point. And uh, I was uh, making my way through the concourse to where my gate was. And I was on one of those um, people mover flat conveyor belts, you know, um, where they you know, put you on there like a piece of baggage. Um, and uh, sc scrolling down the thing and it was early and, and I looked up and there was, a, there was some TV monitors, a whole, one after another, maybe every 10 yards or so after the other. And, and they were all showing the same ad, the same photograph. It was a part of a commercial, if you will, an ad. And it showed this picture that you can see there. Destination where needed most. And those words so grabbed my heart that I, I set down my stuff that I had with me and dug out my phone and I took that picture um, that you see there. Destination, where needed most. What's your destination? Where are you going? It's a pretty common question. We ask it a lot. It's uh, last few seconds of a game between the Packers and the Saints, right? And the Packers are down by a five or six points, whatever it was, and they're just about to drive down the field, and somebody gets up to leave the room, and you go, where are you going? And of course, they're going to the bathroom or the refrigerator. Um, and of course, I use the Packers because it wouldn't work to do the Bears. They haven't had a close game yet. Um, <laughs> Your teenage daughter comes bouncing down the steps, key, keys in hand. See you, Mom. Bye. And you say, where do you think you're going? Where are you going? What's your destination? You hop in your car. You're going to take a road trip. You bring up your Waze app on your phone, and it says, where to? You know, we, we, we think about that. We respond to that a lot. Where are you going? What's your destination? I spend an inordinate amount of time in airports. 
Sometimes when I'm going through the security line, I'll hand my ticket and my passport to the guy at the, at the security counter, and, and he'll say, where are you going today? And I so want to say, you've got my ticket in your hand, <laughs> but I don't do that because that's exactly the kind of thing they're looking for when they ask you a question that they know you already know the answer to. And sometimes I have long delays in airports, some brutally long. And sometimes when somebody will sit down next to me or if I get on a seat of a plane, I'll, I'll engage the person next to me by saying, so, are you headed home or are you headed out? You know, where are you going? What's your destination? Uh, last, that, that day, two Sundays ago, two weeks ago, today, this morning, actually it was the night before. It was, it was Saturday night in Paris. I was waiting for the flight to Amsterdam and a guy came and sat down next to me, and he had a, a young man with him. And um, so I, I did that. I said, are you headed home or are you headed out? And he said, oh, we are headed back to the Netherlands. We live just outside of Amsterdam. And I said, wonderful. And he said, oh, we were just on the most wonderful trip. We we're on our way home. His son was 21. He said, I got to tell you, we flew to Chicago, Illinois. <laughs> And we rented a car, and we spent four weeks driving Route 66 all the way to California. <laughs> and I said, you're kidding me. You drove right past my house. He said, there was a city called Normal. <laughs> I took a picture, and I said, yeah, I, I live just, I, I tell people I live a little south of Normal, and they go, yeah, you do, Bob. <laughs> and I... Uh, Oh my, it was just delightful to talk with him. And that happens a lot. People generally, they want to talk, they're bored, they're sitting in an airport they don't want to be at anyway, so to engage them is a good thing. Where are you going? Generally, when I ask that question, they will reciprocate by asking me, so where are you headed? And um, I, I have to admit, this time it was a little bit different than most because when I told people where I was going, three and a half weeks ago, or told them where I was coming from two weeks ago, um, they were surprised to hear that I had been in or was going to Ukraine. There were a lot of questions, like, why? And Pastor Scott and I thought that maybe you've got questions too, and I think you do because I've had people ask me already. Um, so I want to share with you just some observations, some takeaways from Ukraine, but also, since this is a, a time of uh, worship and of learning in the church, I want to hopefully make a point. Flying into Ukraine is currently not possible. Um, they shoot down planes there right now. So you have to fly into some city in Poland or another country close by and, and travel in by other means. So I flew into uh, Krakow, Poland, and met my boss. He's the guy up there on the left with me. That picture was taken at about 5 o'clock in the morning at the train station in Krakow, Poland, where we caught a train to the Ukrainian border and then stood in a long line and walked across the, the border into Ukraine and then caught a train from there for a 12-hour ride to the capital city of Kiev. I'd been encouraged by one of my contacts in country to stay in a hotel that was directly across the street, can we go back one? Uh, directly across the street from the, the, the Ukrainian Congress building, which is the, the white building there with the yellow and blue columns with the round dome on top. That's the capital building of Ukraine. And over to the right, you can see just the roof of a very ornate Baroque palace. That's, that's where Volodymyr Zelensky lives. That's his palace. That's the White House of Ukraine. And that was taken from my balcony. So pretty choice digs for a missionary. Um, and uh, you can see there's an armored personnel carrier on the street there and barbed wire everywhere and anti-tank batteries. And there were foxholes in the park across the street. So it may sound really glorious, but it was actually a little nerve wracking. We were told to stay there because that area is surrounded by the most air missile defenses and the, their bomb shelters are the deepest. Um, so we, we stayed there and by the way, uh, the most, the, probably the best hotel room I have ever had in my life, and I used to work for Marriott Corporation, um, and it was $73 a night. So your, your missionary money is not wasted. 
It was after sunset when we arrived and the, the 20 square block area around the Capitol building there is on complete blackout uh, during the evenings and it was after dark and so we pulled up in front of this place and I mean it was pitch black. Um, and the guy said, okay, here we are. And I'm looking out the windows going, uh, where are we? Uh, there was barbed wire in front of the hotel entrance and there was anti-tank barriers up. And, um, but when we got out of the, the Uber ride, I saw the logo on the door and we went inside. There were lights on inside, but they had blackout curtains keeping uh, any light from escaping. Um, I think my boss and I may have been the only civilian staying in the hotel. I think it was mostly occupied by military people who were doing guard duty for the Congress and the President's house and the park across the street. Um, but it was, it was interesting. The, the guy at the front desk said, don't go on your balcony overnight, they'll shoot you. Um, don't have any lights on that can be seen from outdoors. You can have lights on in your room but have the curtains closed and after midnight all lights have to be off until 5 a.m. So it was a little interesting. And he said, we have a bomb shelter in the basement. Uh, if there's an air raid, there we'll come over. You'll hear the sirens, but we will also come over the loudspeaker to let you know that you need to evacuate. I had already talked to my friends, and they said, well, you know, you can evacuate, or you can do what we do, just roll over and go back to sleep. Um, I did get up one night and go in the bathroom, because they had said, at least go in the bathroom where there's more walls between you and the outside. If the windows get blown out of your room, it won't shred you. So I did that one night. I figured if a bomb went off, I'd want to be in the bathroom anyway. So, <laughs> so why do that? You know, that's the big question that everybody said. Why, why were you in Ukraine? Why would we travel all those hours to an active war zone, invalidating our life and health insurance policies the minute we cross the border? Why would you do that? And the answer goes to the heart of my job. The work company that I work for, the mission agency that I work for, is committed to an audacious mission. We are asking God for a gospel movement among every least reached people group in our generation. And we have workers all around the world striving for that goal. And I serve as part of the leadership over about one-fourth of the world the Europe and the Mediterranean region, Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. And while many parts of the world, like Africa and South America, Central America, and some parts of Asia are seeing dramatic growth in the church, the region that you see there in the blue there that, that I work in is actually one of the most atheistic in the world and one of the least evangelized areas of the globe. Our organization currently has 85 missionary families working in 22 countries, but that leaves 37 of the 59 countries that we oversee, I oversee, uh, without a worker. My boss is in charge of kind of caring for those missionaries that we have on the field. My job is to focus on those 37 countries where we don't have anybody. Because just because we don't have a worker there doesn't mean that God's not at work there. He is at work there. And my job is to find out what God is up to in places where we don't have workers, connect with those people that God is using, and find out how we can help them reach their own people with the gospel of Christ. It's a really cool job, and I love what I do. We work with identifying movements of God in those countries, and we connect with those local leaders, and we help them to build churches, to develop leaders, to, to see disciples made throughout their culture. It may be a blind church planter in Hungary um, who works with illiterate people in Hungary, Romania, and eastern Ukraine. It may be a growing wave of evangelical churches in Tunisia that, is being planted, that are being planted by business people and young college people who've come to faith in Jesus in a country that is 99.5% Muslim, and yet God is doing a work there. Uh, it may be a Russian believer and his wife who were in the States, his wife's American, and they were in the States when the war broke out. They can't get back to Russia now to where they were working in Siberia. And so they've gone to Estonia to work among the Russian-speaking people who live in eastern Estonia and bring the gospel to them where there is no gospel witness at all. So it has a wide variety of ministry profiles and places where we help people. Our work in Ukraine over the last few years has been to help the church with leadership development and with expanding their vision of missions. 
Ukraine is one of the most evangelized countries in Europe. In fact, I believe, and I've seen the numbers, I believe that Ukraine is the most evangelical nation in Europe. Okay, so when we talk about this war and why is Putin doing this, yes, there's greed, yes, there's just, you know, power hungry, but I believe there's also a spiritual dynamic to it. I think that Satan wants to crush the church of Ukraine because it is a potentially transforming power within the whole continent and into central Eurasia, all the stands. Um, and so God is trying to do it, or Satan is trying to do what he can to destroy that. We're trying to do what we can to help them promote that mission sending idea of sending workers from Ukraine into other nations around them. So I work closely with the president and vice presidents of the Ukrainian Baptist Union there in that picture up there on the corner. I work with a lot of regional pastors and senior pastors from districts of Ukraine. And I work with local pastors from not just Baptist churches, uh, which is what my agency happens to be, but I don't make a big deal about labels um, and neither does my group. That's why I'm with them. Um, so I, this time I, I spoke at, at uh, Assembly of God Pentecostal churches, I've, I've worked with Methodists, I've worked with Baptists, I've worked with you name it. If they love Jesus, then I'm all in with them. And uh, so we work, we work across the, the spectrum. During our brief visit there, Pastor Vasily, uh, who's the, the pastor who contacted me about the, uh, uh, the kids going to camp, he's uh, with a group that's Pentecostal Assembly of God. He oversees about a dozen churches in the immediate area around Kiev. Um, and he took us around to, to see some of the areas where he lives. He lives in the northern suburbs of the capital city, and he lives specifically in the area where in the opening month of the war, you might remember the Russians had that long caravan of, of, of tanks and armored vehicles that were coming in, and they got pretty close to Kiev, but they got stopped. And when they got stopped, the Battle of Kiev was fought there for about five weeks, and it was basically right in his neighborhood. And so he took us around to some of the churches and the people that were in there that had been evacuated during the occupation of the Russians until they were basically eventually pulled back by Putin. In a city called Borod Borodyanka, we met um, a woman by the name of Katarina. This is her right there in the green. Her city was occupied by the Russian army in the opening weeks of the war. And the soldiers, she told me, came and banged on her door with the butt of their rifle. Her husband answered the door and they said, you've got 10 minutes to get whatever you want and get out and leave the door unlocked when you go. So they gathered up what they could, threw it in their car and left. Um, their, their house was later occupied by an officer. A bunch of troops were put into a school that was two doors down the street from her house. There were two old women that lived in a house right next to hers who refused to go. They, they had nowhere to go. They didn't want to go. Um, they weren't going to give in, and so they didn't. They wouldn't refuse to open their door. And, and the Russians um, forced the door open and shot both of those women. Her husband, in the midst of all this, as they were fleeing, uh, had a heart attack and died. Um, her house was occupied for a while, but then as the Russians began to retreat and as the battle raged in her neighborhood between the Ukrainian army and the Russian army, her house was hit by a bomb and destroyed as long as, as well as that neighbor's house that was there. They were, it was completely destroyed. And in the picture that you see on the screen there, um, the bottom one here, um, that's a group of men from this, this small church, this small Assembly of God church that, that she attended. The pastor is in that photograph, and they were actually working to rebuild her house. Uh, they, were, they were laying the foundation, getting ready to put in the footers. The pastor was down putting rebar in uh, for them to pour the concrete. All by hand, um, and all, uh, I said, so how, you know, do you have to get like inspectors to come in and make sure the footers are the right depth? And he goes, no, we don't have to do that here. <laughs> in the city of Kremnitz, we met a woman named Mora. That's her up in the right. She's from Bakhmut, and that's a city you may have heard of. Bakhmut was a city that in the last nine months has been the site of intense fighting and indescribable destruction. Um, uh, the Wagner group was, was doing a lot of the work there, and they were just brutal. Um, her husband and her son were both killed uh, in the attack on Bakhmut, and she made her way out, and she made her way west, and she was taken in by people at a local church in Kremenitz. Uh, the pastor 
is there in the bottom picture wearing a blue shirt waving. His name is Victor, and he's the pastor of that church, but he's also the, what they call the regional presbyter. He's the senior pastor over that state of the, that oblast of Ukraine. The church took her in, loved on her, provided for her clothing, food, shelter. She, did not, she was not a believer at the time, but, but she became a believer, and she gave her heart to Christ. Um, as, as has happened to... I'm telling you, the church in Ukraine is, is growing by leaps and bounds. The leadership of the, the Baptist Union said that they are overwhelmed by thousands, thousands of people who are packing into their churches, standing room only, sometimes seven days a week. Um, and at the same time as they've got these churches that are packed, they have 400 pulpits that are currently empty because pastors have been killed, drafted, or driven away. And so they've got lay leaders who are leading the things, but they've never been trained. They aren't licensed. They aren't ordained. And they've got all this stuff going on. It's one of the things I work with them in is how can we identify, license, train, and then encourage and strengthen new pastors to go into these pulpits? And, and, um, and, and how can we plant new churches that can take in some of the excess that they've got with all these people who are packing into the existing churches? That's one of the things we work on with them. Anyway, Pastor Victor there, uh, his church... Before the war even started, I was there a couple of years ago, and he showed me these two houses that they have there. They're um, houses that the church owns, and they are for orphans. In the Ukrainian orphanage system, when a kid gets to be 18 years old, male or female, they're basically booted out of the state-run system, and if they haven't been adopted by the time they're 18, they're kind of just abandoned and left on their own. They, they're just, they really, sadly, a lot of them fall into things like, like gangs, crime, or into tr human trafficking. Um, so this church has two homes that it runs an orphanage for the people who come out of the system but have nowhere to go, and they teach them job skills, and they help them get settled and, and find work. And uh, they took, more, they took uh, Mora here uh, after she had been with them for about six or eight months, and they actually made her the, the house mom for that house that you see that is there that's one of those orphanage homes. We sat there at the table in the kitchen and she told us her story about fleeing Bakhmut and her, child, her son and her husband being killed and she started to cry. Uh, she said, I never wanted to be a Naomi. <clears throat> Naomi was the mother of Ruth. You might remember she lost her, her sons, her husband, just had you know, no hope. And I said to her, um, I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that Naomi didn't want to be a Naomi either in that sense. But I said, think about the story of Naomi. You know, the Lord restored to her a new family, new hope. And, and the amazing thing is that Naomi became the great, great, great grandma of King David. I said, you know, God has given you a new family, a new home. And you don't know what one of these boys that you're working with right now, who's her, maybe 19 or 20 years old, they might be the next president or some future president of Ukraine, or they might be some great preacher that will lead people to Christ. You know, we don't know what God is up to, and we can trust in him, though, to always guide our steps. In Rivna, a city there uh, that those photographs were taken, and we met with a group of about 30 men that, that we've been working with for about the last three or four years in development of a disciple-making core. These, the pastor there, Pastor Volodya, um, when I've asked him the first time we talked, what, what do you want most? And he said, I want something that will take uh, people who are either not believers yet or new believers and, and take them right through to becoming missionaries and, and, and soul winners, you know, that will, that will take them right through the maturing process. And so we've been working with them on that. And they've got 30 guys. And there's another photograph over here on the table of a different time we were with that same group of people. So we got to hang out with them. Most of the guys that are there are on deep threat of being drafted and taken into the military, including the pastors. Um, and uh, there was one young man there up in the corner, uh, in your right corner there, um, whose name is Dennis. Dennis is already in the military, and he was home on a, on a leave, a 10-day leave, but he had been recalled that day to go back the next morning uh, after only four days off because they were going to be going into a new offensive. And so we gathered as a group around him to pray. There's another shot there you can bring up now if you would. Uh, we all gathered around Dennis and prayed over him, and um, he recorded a really neat greeting um, that if you'd like, I'll share with you later, uh, thanking us for our prayers for Ukraine, asking us to pray for him and his fellow soldiers. He said, when people are praying for us, we feel it, and we know it. 
pray for him because all the training we've done with him as part of our group for the last few years, he's now putting into practice by being really the presence of Christ in his army group, uh, one of the only evangelical believers in that group. And so he's had, got a chance to share the gospel with them and to lead them to Christ. Pastor Volodya of that church is a full-time dentist. Most pastors in Ukraine are bivocational. Um, and he shared a story with me of him going to do dental work, uh, free dental work for soldiers on the front lines. And he showed me some videos of stuff that he had done with, with people there who had either just had you know, normal things like cavities or whatever they needed done, but a lot of the guys had lost teeth or had cracked teeth from the concussion of nearby mortars going off and missiles. So um, he showed me videos of them going into a school that had been bombed out um, and they were using the rooms that were still intact for surgery and for dental work and for whatever they needed to do. And, and while he's showing me this video of walking through the building, I could hear in the background all the video of uh, artillery exploding every now and again. So um, crazy stuff. It's a very tough existence there. Uh, while life in many ways goes on normal, there's food in the grocery stores, there's clothing. I bought this at a shop in Kiev. I mean, it's, it's in many ways very normal, but the, the awareness of the war never goes away. In every city, every village, there are memorials to the people who've been lost. Um, the reminders of the dead are everywhere. Each of those things that's standing up there are, is a triangle, and each of them has the face of six men on it. And that's just in one city. Hundreds of people that have been killed from that city. Um, they also had on display... Uh, some Russian military stuff that had been taken, and in one of the cities, Irpin, another place where the Battle of Kiev was fought, there was a, a, a pile of cars uh, that the Russians had destroyed when people were trying to flee, um, riddled, riddled with mortar and, um, and machine gun fire. Um, the reminders were everywhere. Uh, the 3 a.m. Um, Air raid warnings that go off are intended to, by, by the enemy to not allow the people of, Kiev, of Ukraine anywhere in the country to get a good night's rest. So every night about 3 a.m. the alarms would go off. Um, and it's all done to, to, to just disrupt their lives, to help them, to make them lose their hope. Um, I was there 10 days. Uh, Mom will tell you. <laughs> Um, I, I've got, been on a lot of trips that some of them have lasted a lot longer than 10 days, but I have never returned from a trip more tired than I did from this one. I'm still recovering from the emotional and the spiritual and the physical exhaustion that I didn't even realize I felt until I got home and was able to take a deep breath. They've been living with it for 560 days. And so there I was on my journey home walking bleary-eyed after an eight-hour drive to the Polish border, an hour walking across the border, a bus ride to a train station, a three-hour train ride to Krakow, a flight from Krakow to Paris, another flight from Paris to Amsterdam, and two more flights to come to Atlanta and then Bloomington when I saw that sign. Destination, where needed most. You know, sometime in the last year, probably, maybe two years ago, some ad executive was charged to come up with a new marketing campaign that would grab the attention of people and move them, motivate them to respond. That's what advertising is meant to do. And this ad, which I found out later was for Doctors Without Borders, does that. We honor people who go where they're most needed, don't we? The day after I returned from Ukraine was 9-11. And we once again paused from what we do in our normal daily lives to remember the memory, not only of the innocent victims that were killed, but to honor the memory of those who went into burning towers when everybody else was throwing all they could to get out of burning towers. And we remember them and we honor them. And we honor those who still do it to this day. We honor the military, because they go to where they're needed most to help people they don't know that a lot of times aren't even from their own country. But they go because they want to defend freedom for innocent victims. I believe that 
we are moved by that all of us are moved by a spirit of wanting to help those in the most need. We see a need and we are moved to assist. Even the most cynical among us will run out and try to help someone who is in imminent danger. And you know why that is? I believe it's because we are made in the image of God. And God has a heart that is driven by going where needed most. Listen to a few verses from Scripture that demonstrate the heart of God in this matter. Isaiah chapter 40 says, He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Psalm 50, Call on me in your day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you will honor me. John 3, 16, the most well-known verse in all of Scripture, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. Jesus himself in Mark 1, 38 said, we must go to other towns as well and preach to them. That is why I have come. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I haven't come to be with the righteous, but to call sinners to repentance. And Philippians chapter 2 perhaps captures it better than any other passage. It tells us that though he was and is God, Jesus chose to lay aside his rights as God, and he emptied himself, and he took on the form of a servant, and being found as a human being, he, he humbled himself even more and became obedient even to the point of death on the cross. Not just any death, but the worst possible death. Can you hear the heart of God, can you see it in those verses? There are dozens more throughout Scripture just like them. God is all about going where he's needed most. He knows all about sacrifice for those who are in the greatest need and those who are in the greatest danger. And when we talk about that need and that danger, it is of eternal consequence. When we talk about God coming to where needed most, we're talking about the lost souls of human beings for all eternity. Hopeless without him. And so he doesn't say, do what you can to get to me and we'll see what happens. He doesn't do that. He says, I will come to you and make a way. And I believe that a piece of that image of God is placed within us. And that's why we go where needed most. It's the heart of the church, isn't it? Jesus in his great commission said, go and preach the gospel to every nation. Make disciples of the whole world. We go where we are needed most. There's no greater need among the human race than for people to know God's love. And that's what we are called to do. So where are you going? doesn't always look the same for everybody. It's possible that in this room there are some people who are called to actually go physically to a place of most need. Perhaps it's short term in ministry. Maybe it's a lifetime call to missions. Maybe it's a career or maybe it's in your retirement that you go to serve. If you feel God calling you to go and to serve overseas or to serve across the street or across town, then see me after the service, and I'd love to talk with you about it. Others may respond in a more supportive role. Even the firefighters, we talked earlier about firefighters going into burning buildings. For every one of them who enters a building, there are people who stay behind and support them. They man the pumps, they drive the trucks, they care for the triage of those who've been wounded, they care for firefighters who have been overcome by heat or smoke. Even the the dispatchers who sit in an office are part of the team that gets that firefighter to where he needs to go. The soldiers who are serving on the front line are only there because there are other people that are part of the same team that allow them to be there, that supply them with food and water and munitions and care. And they're further supported by a loving family that may be thousands of miles away but lets them know that they love them and they care for them and they support them in what they're doing. In the same way, there is a great need and a wonderful place of serving where we are most needed by everybody in this room. If you don't go physically, you can certainly go supportively. 
When I go to Egypt and work with leaders there to raise up the next generation of Christian leaders in the Arab world, you are there because this church supports me in my mission. When I go to Albania, like I was earlier this summer, where God is raising up the first generation of Christians in a nation that's the only country on earth that ever declared itself an atheist nation. And yet God is raising up a generation of Christians in that nation now. And when I go there, you go with me because you're supporting the work we do. And when a group of men from a village in Ukraine that was gutted by the Russian occupying troops gather with their limited resources to help rebuild a destroyed home for a widowed woman, we can be there with them by helping them out with what they need in order to make it happen. And when a young man, 22 years old, named Dennis, goes to the front lines in the Ukrainian army and shares the love of Christ and the peace of God among people who are scared literally to death, we can be there with him by doing what he asked us to do and praying for him. Destination, where needed most. In Acts 20, 24, Paul was speaking to the leaders of the church in Ephesus. He knew it was the last time he would ever see them and that his life was on the line as he continued to do his work. And he said these words, I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry for, that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. So where are you going? It may be Clinton, Illinois, or Kiev, Ukraine, but will you go where you're needed most? Will you spend your life, your resources, your gifts on something that will be a response to the greatest need in human race, in the human race? Henry James said, the greatest use of a life is to spend it on something that outlasts it, and nothing outlasts our lives more than a human soul that lives for all eternity. For me, my destination is to go where needed most. You've been called to go there too, and I invite you to join me in that place. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are honored that you would invite us to participate in your ministry of bringing life to the world by being your ambassadors and your spokespeople. And while some places may be obviously more in need than others, the fact is there are people all around us who are in that same imminent danger of an eternity separated from you. Help us, Lord, to be responsive to that. Help us, Lord, to sense your Holy Spirit telling us that we need to go and we need to tell them. Whether it's across the street, across town, or across the oceans, help us, Lord, to respond positively to your call in our lives to go where we're needed most. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate that message and sharing uh, with us. Uh, after we dismiss, uh, if you have some questions for Bob, or if you'd like to uh, check out some of the things that he has displayed, we encourage you to do that. And I uh, challenge you to take this message with you. Where are you needed the most? And that's where God can plant you and help you to grow so that you can help others as well. Again, uh, let's bow in a brief word of prayer as we dismiss, and um, then if you have questions or would like to talk with Bob afterwards, you may. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those who are willing to be used by you, those who are willing to serve in any capacity where needed most. And I pray that we might be challenged, wherever we are, that you would use us to reach others for Christ. Go with us now. Help us not to quickly forget what we've heard tonight. Burn it deep into our hearts and our minds. May we not ever be the same, having heard your word tonight. 
We do pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.